and I'm with VTOS Healthcare. I am the bereavement manager for VTOS. Um, we are a hospice service and we provide, um, in addition to hospice services, we provide grief counseling and grief um, support to um, San, San Antonio and surrounding areas, um, including the Seguin area. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, I appreciate Erica for inviting me to come and talk to you a little bit about grief and the holidays and how difficult that can be. Um, I've been with VTOS for almost 16 years and I'm also a social worker. Um, in addition to obviously being a social worker, um, I am the bereavement manager and we follow all of our families um, after the death of their loved one for up to 13 months after the passing in order to make sure that they have good grief support and that they are connected to appropriate resources. Um, we're very proud of the fact that um, we provide a lot of grief and loss um, resources and support to the community. Today, I wanted to share some with you guys about um, grief and the holidays, but we will kind of backtrack a little bit first and talk about how grief affects the whole person. I think it's important that we backtrack with that because um, many times we are not, um, we don't know what grief really is or will do until we're in it. And it affects each of us differently. It affects each of us um, because our relationships are different with the person that has passed. And so it's important that we kind of gain some understanding. We're not great in the United States about talking about grief and loss. Um, we typically may hear about it if we attend college. Um, we may hear a little bit about it there. But for the most part, it's not until you're in it that you really start to understand, right? Um, but we want to backtrack a little bit and talk about how grief actually affects all of us, our entire person. Um, there is a physical effect that we have to grief. There's an emotional effect that we have to grief, a spiritual, it affects our family, and it also affects us socially. So as seen on the, um, the document that is up, um, and there is a handout if you'd like to go grab one on that table and we'll go over some of those pages. The impact of grief on our physical being is mostly that there are stress hormones that are released when we grieve, as we're grieving. Um, cortisol is that stress hormone and our body seems to make it double when we're grieving. It is, um, it works through the body. Um, it is really re-released whenever we experience another wave of grief, which is what we experience as grievers. Grief is not tend to be, does not tend to be linear, meaning it goes from A to B. That's not what it does. Grief kind of looks more like a spiral and kind of in and out and goes back and forth. So, we, the, that stress hormone gets re-released as we experience different waves of grief. And it's also believed that 60% of our energy can actually be taken up by grief. That's a lot, 60%. Um, so if you are grieving the loss of someone and you feel extremely tired and you feel just very, um, you know, a lack of energy, there's a reason for that. The effects of grief are that those hormones that we are producing because of the stress are going to dehydrate the body. Our immune system is compromised as we get sick, or if we get and we can get sick. Um, our memory can be affected. Cognitive functioning and making decisions becomes difficult. It's difficult to sleep. Exhaustion can be very common 
and lack of energy makes accomplishing different things on the daily very difficult. Some things that can help our physical being as we're grieving is drinking lots of water. The water that we drink, if we increase water intake as we're grieving, even by maybe a water bottle a day, um, can actually decrease that stress hormone. It dilutes it. So it helps. You know, we hear about how important it is to drink water. Um, this is another reason, right? We want to increase a little, at least by a little bit, our water intake. We want to find ways to rest rather than sleep. Um, you know, some people have a hard time sleeping. Some people sleep maybe a lot more than they're used to. So finding some time to rest, giving ourselves some breaks throughout the day is important. Exercise can be great as well because it increases endorphins, which are the good hormones. So that kind of counteracts those not good at hormones, those stress hormones. It is good to continue or to get into some type of a routine, whether that be a past routine or a new routine. Lists can help with the memory, writing some lists down. Writing helps reorder the brain, so th that can help. And talking about grief helps reorder the brain. A lot of times we find that we try to avoid talking about our pain and talking about our grief, talking about our loss so much and pushing it down and pushing it down that it typically help, it makes us even more distracted and it, it um, helps us to not be organized because we are really still focused on that grief, but we're just paying a lot of attention to pushing it down. Emotionally, Grief is kind of one of the few times in our lives when it's normal to really feel very out of sorts. And um, the loss can make you feel out of control. Like I said, it's kind of a roller coaster feeling. Those feelings can come in waves, and they're often un unpredictable, and that can be really hard. Feelings are powerful, and they can de definitely be overwhelming. Um, the effects of grief can be a twilight zone experience that can feel, you can kind of feel outside of time and space. Um, expressing feelings may be new and embarrassing. There can be fluctuations between being numb and being overwhelmed. Feelings often flood, and we can experience more than one at a time. There could be a sadness. We could feel anger. We can feel guilt. We can also feel relief. Sometimes feelings don't make sense, and yet they tend to dictate everything about our world, and that can be stressful. We may struggle with an unwelcome freedom, loneliness, can haunt us even when we're in a crowd. And sometimes we feel hopeless and frightened. Some things that can help as we struggle with grief emotionally are trying to discover ways to honor the feelings rather than fight them. And what I mean by that is many times um, it can feel like it's easier to kind of push those feelings down instead of allow them to happen. But what happens when we continue to push those feelings down? I'll use um, a, um, a beach ball as an example. We're in the pool and we push the beach ball underwater. That can be hard, right? We have to push it down kind of with all of our might. And then what happens when we release it? It flies up, it could fly to the side, it could fly out of the pool, it could hit somebody else. That's kind of what happens when we push our feelings down as well. They will come up and because we, we can't always control that. And they may come up at somebody. They may come up at us. They may come up in places that we don't really expect them to. So it's important to think about our feelings as something we should honor. Allow for those feelings versus fight them. And um, what we call lean into those feelings. Allow them to happen. Um, 
and, and typically that softens those feelings some. Find ways to be safe with your feelings, um, telling somebody about them, compartmentalizing them, writing about them. Find ways to concretely express your feelings. That may, again, that may pull that exercise, that may pull that walking in nature, that may pull some self-care into it. Find someone to trust with your feelings. Search for a balance between feeling and thinking. And talk to your loved one that you've lost out loud. There's nothing wrong with that. There is a connection that we still have to our loved one, even though the physical being is no longer here, we still have that connection. We can still continue to have that soul connection with them. Spiritually, we are impacted by grief because sometimes loss can challenge our beliefs about purpose in life um, and our sense that something greater than ourselves guides and supports us. Grief can kind of fracture beliefs and leave us feeling lost and betrayed. Effects of, the, of spiritual um, impacts on grief. We can have a crisis of faith. We are trying to make sense of the loss and we find ourselves questioning our traditional beliefs. And those without traditional beliefs may, have, um, may be troubled by other spiritual beliefs or have difficulty making meaning of their loss. Why becomes a very nagging question. There may be considerable anger at God or a higher power. We may have experienced um, unexpected, frightening, different spiritual experiences as we're grieving. Our faith community may withdraw or address our pain with teachings rather than comfort, and that might make us feel abandoned or misunderstood. We may avoid returning to our spiritual community because we are emotional during services and we fear being judged. Some things that can help is to recognize that our faith actually might be maturing. Death kind of for forces us to re-examine what we believe. And we can search for ways to rediscover your faith. Talk to your clergy about your spiritual experiences or challenges. Return to or discover new ways that you can experience your spiritual connection. And don't be afraid to have it out with God or with your higher power. It's better than not speaking to him at all. Keep asking why in your prayers and in your life. That's okay. And plan for your return to services and ask for what you need. Many times that might be us going to our clergy person and saying, I really need to talk to you. I would like to sit down and discuss some of the things I've been feeling. Um, these are things that I'm, I'm afraid of when I go back to church. If you can't go in person for whatever reason, because you might get too emotional, watch something on TV. Watch a, you know, on, online. Grief affects our family because it kind of breaks the symmetry of the family. It can also dredge up some old conflicts. And grief sometimes separates us from each other because we're afraid of upsetting each other or the family, uh, different family members. Sometimes day-to-day -day chores and activities are a reminder that someone is missing in our family. The one who died is not present to pay, play their part in maybe family conflict. And so the family feels very off-balanced. And everyone is typically running on empty because everyone grieves differently. So sometimes no one is getting what they need because it is so different and that can be really hard in a family. Um, there may be resistance to taking on the jobs of the one who has passed. When a spouse dies, the surviving parent often tries to be both mom and dad. The surviving parent does not know how to grieve and take care of the family. How do you do that together? How can, I have, how can I grieve, but also have to continue to take care of children? Children are afraid and either try to be very good or typically act out. Adult children may avoid their surviving parent because seeing them reminds them of the parent they've lost. So some things that can help is that we name what is happening in the family, that we can be brave enough to name that elephant 
in the room, right? We can bring the deceased into daily life, tell stories about them, um, about what, they, what the one who was missing would have done if they were there, have the courage to take on some of the chores and the roles that the deceased would do, talk about what each family member needs as they grieve, Some may not know what they need, and that's okay, but start that discussion of how are you? How are you dealing with this loss? This is how it's affecting me. I don't know if you're feeling some of those feelings. Um, Don't be afraid to show your grief to your children and be able to live on. Many times our ability to show our grief is a model for our children, young and old, right? I've been in a room where everyone is trying so very hard to stay strong and say, we're not, we can't cry, we gotta stay strong, we gotta stay strong, and then we have that one person that is brave enough to shed some tears and then typically allows for others to do that too, gives them permission, and that's something that everyone probably needed to do. Um, ask for help with the day-to-day living give children permission to express their feelings and talk about their loss find ways to connect with the surviving parent that are safe and allow you to grieve together find a common ground socially we are impacted by grief in that we may feel out of place with friends or co-workers if we've lost a spouse especially Friends can say careless things. If they don't know what to say, they might avoid us as well. It takes a tremendous amount of energy to be around other people, and yet we long to connect and are lonely. The effects of grief, we may avoid social situations. We feel lonely and forgotten when friends stop asking us out. There might be anger at friends for not understanding or giving us useless advice. There may be a jealousy of friends for being able to have a good life and that their loved one is alive. We might feel abandoned by our friends. We may be, um, there might be a fear that the boss and coworkers won't understand that we can't be as productive as we had been. And um, our focus may not be there. We're afraid that they may not understand that. Because not, we don't get very many bereavement days typically after we lose somebody. We're kind of right back at work. And that can be really hard. Some things that help is to find a balance between needed alone time, because when we are grieving, that is important. It's important that we have some alone time, that we're able to kind of withdraw from people and and spend some time alone. And then we want to also slowly encourage ourselves to reconnect with friends by practicing the 20 minute rule. And the 20 minute rule is basically, it's something that we'll talk about a little bit later as well as the holidays are coming up is that, okay, I can do anything for 20 minutes. So if there is a function, if there is a social situation coming up, it's it's something that we can tell that person that has invited us, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna plan on staying for at least 20 minutes. And then if you see me leave, just know that I wanted to be here and now I need to go and why that we're grieving and that we're struggling with that balance and that's okay. We can make a list of different types of friends, those that are going to listen and those that want to be helped to you by doing things for you and those that, um, that you can just be there superficially with, you know, those friends that aren't deep friends. Um, because with those that help and avoid, those that don't. We have to be aware of the fact that uh, we have to start feeling, okay, who is going to help me through this and who's not going to help me through this, who, who maybe um, isn't someone that I should spend a lot of time with um, as I'm grieving. Educate friends about grief and what you do and do not need. And that's kind of, why, again, why I talk about how it affects our whole being is that you may be feeling all these different ways that grief is affecting you and really haven't been able to put a name to it, haven't been able to, to really focus on the fact that, oh, it's not just emotionally 
that I'm being affected. It's affecting me physically, spiritually, socially, in my family. And when you're ready, issue an indication to start um, inviting you to places to f- again. Let your friends know, okay, I'm ready to be invited again. Be proactive about what you need and negotiate that with your boss if needed. And educate your boss and coworkers about what they and you can expect over the next year. If you don't know, and that is typical, right? Say so and ask for help in clarifying work expectations. I want to speak briefly about um, some of the different, we're not going to go to the occasions one yet, and that's, that's fine, but um, another part to grief and um, a journey of the heart is the different feelings that grief does bring up. I'm going to name some of those. Denial, numbness, feeling overwhelmed, disbelief, guilt, blame, bargaining, confusion, hopelessness, panic, shock, why, sadness, despair, emptiness, acceptance, surrender, hope. And we could be on a spiritual high. There can be joy. There can be peace, comfort, um, close to others. We can feel withdrawn, isolated, shame, anger at self, anger at others, regret. We can have anger at the person that's died. We can have love. We can have rage, we can feel helpless, we can be whiny, judgmental, searching, longing, penning, gratitude, in a fog, relief, alienated from God, and calm. That's a whole lot of emotions. That's a whole lot of different from one spectrum to another. And in one day, we can can certainly feel many of these on different sides of different spectrums, right? We can certainly wake up feeling very sad, very emotional, maybe angry that we've lost our person. And by the end of the day, we may have found something that provides us with joy. And that's okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of grief. Um, William Warden is a renowned um, grief specialist and researcher. He's um, developed his own um, grief tasks. Tasks of grief is what they're called. And um, and then there's a local person, um, Paula Loring, who has also developed um, something that correlates with it. And so, First, when we start, when we are presented with someone that has passed, our heart breaks, right? And you can picture a heart broken. That's some shock. There's some denial there. And Warden says that that task is accepting the reality of that loss. It can feel crazy. It takes time because our heart must learn to bear what our mind knows to be true. I call it the separation between our heart and our mind. Our brain, our mind can tell us that someone has died. And we, can, we understand that in many ways. But our heart, it can take a while for that heart to catch up to that acceptance. This takes a lot of, a, of physical and emotional energy. And we kind of oscillate between shock, despair, disbelief, and facing that reality of the loss. Next, our heart bleeds. You can picture a heart with some drops, right? Bleeding. And that's longing. Warden's second task of grief is processing the pain of that loss. This is what we're doing as our heart bleeds. It's a time when everything can remind you of what you've lost. The pain must be dealt with or it will go underground and manifest into physical symptoms or avoidant behavior that can interfere with normal functioning and healthy relationships. That's what I was talking about when we push that grief down, those feelings down, like the beach ball, pushing those things down instead of processing them and allowing those feelings to happen will typically manifest into physical symptoms and a lot of different behaviors. 
The next is that our heart surrenders. You can picture a heart kind of on its side. And that's acceptance. This correlates with Warden's third task of grief, adjusting to the world without your person. And this kind of involves both an inner and outer part of discovery of how you're going to live life now. You may have to take on new roles and new, learn new things, new skills, new things that the person used to do for you. Values and basic beliefs may be challenged, which can change how you experience the world and your sense of self now. So this is an adjustment period um, where we're learning to accept and we are learning to live in a world without them. And the fourth task, um, we can picture slowly our hearts becoming whole again. And this is an integration. Developing an enduring connection is what Warden calls it. Um, the physical body has died, but that relationship with your loved one can still live on. This connection can be an inner resource from which you can draw comfort, courage, and even guidance. And that's all we talk about, being able to still talk to that person out loud. Um, you can write to them, go to the cemetery and visit them. You know, bring them along with you in your life still. Remember them at important times. Speak their name. Talk about good memories. Talk about not so good memories. But keeping them alive and, and bringing them along with you. And so it can be really hard because this journey that I just talked about, these different tasks, they don't always happen in a specific order. Your heart might be bleeding while it surrenders. You may be struggling to become a new person while at the same time um, re or reacting in ways that reflect who you were when the deceased was alive. Even years later, an event might trigger a deep longing. The journey is not a straight line but rather a crazy and twisting roller coaster type path which switches backs and then dead ends. This is normal, but it's exhausting. And slowly we learn to trust that the journey of grief will lead our heart to healing if we follow the chaos. And now we'll talk a little bit about using the holidays to heal in special occasions, right? You know, typically that first year um, after our loved one has passed and we're just entering our first Christmas or we've had our first Thanksgiving or Halloween or birthday or anniversary, um, you know, we need some tools. We need some tools for meeting the challenges of these occasions and seasons. A huge piece to using special holidays um, and special occasions to heal is self-care. We have to be kind to ourselves. This is a time we're vulnerable. There are lots of different things that are happening to us. Um, it's important that we take good care of ourselves. We want to eat good, get good rest, exercise, and try to feed our soul. Choose how much or how, or how little you wish to participate in the holiday season and give yourself permission to do the comforting activities and pass on the rest. It's really about planning. It's about thinking about the things that are going to be occurring that have happened in the past tradition-wise and what you choose to want to do that feels right and what you feel you might want to pass on this year. And being okay with that and giving yourself permission. We want to eliminate unnecessary stresses. Um, keeping busy must be balanced with taking time to talk about and feel your grief. Respect that time to have that alone time, that time by ourselves. We want to allow ourselves to be around others and then be able to retreat as well in order to refuel ourselves. Express your feelings. The surest way to get through grief is to feel it. I'm going to say that again. 
The surest way to get through grief is to feel it and not deny it. Feelings that are expressed will ultimately soften. When we allow ourselves to have those feelings, they soften. But if we suppress them again and push them down or ignore them, they won't be worked through and they will come up in different areas. We want to drink lots of water to keep ourselves hydrated and flush out toxins. Again, that, that stress hormone cortisol. Um, and it's something that's natural that our body is going to do. But it, and it contributes to that inability to focus, inability to concentrate, and that just feeling of being very run down. So drinking water, a good amount of water, helps us counter those effects. Find ways to rest and grieve during the holidays. Do things that bring peace and quiet. Find a favorite place in a garden or a sanctuary or your home. Reflect on nature, memories, or a belief. Allow yourself to feel the true meaning of the holiday and connect with your spirituality. Implement that 20-minute rule. You may not feel like you have energy or an inclination to attend a holiday or social function, but you might feel like you have to or you're obligated to do that. Maybe you want to try it. Maybe you want to try to do that. Try that 20-minute rule. You can make an appearance, stay for 20 minutes, and excuse yourself. You've met that social obligation, and you've taken care of yourself too. And we have to really start thinking about that aspect of it, that this is not about you going for a little while and running away from it. This is about, I've gone, I want to contribute to that social obligation, but then I really need to take care of myself too. Work off stresses of the season, get into exercise, like biking or swimming or just walking around the block. Because again, exercise releases those good hormones, that endorphins, those endorphins in your body, those feel good hormones. We want to watch out for social or for overindulgence, sometimes too much food, alcohol, or sometimes we do that excessive spending, right? Um, that can be a way that we really avoid our grief. I mean, a glass of wine from time to time might be relaxing, but several glasses can develop into a problem. We want to try to maintain that moderation and balance. We want to take initiative and ask for what we need. Counter the conspiracy of silence by mentioning the name of your loved one. And give others, that helps and gives others permission to talk about them. Many people that I talk to on a regular basis that are grieving, all that they want to do is talk about their loved one, but they feel that they can't because it may invoke some emotion and they may cry and people aren't comfortable with that. So then they avoid just talking about them all together. But if you let that, your family, your friends know that it's okay if we talk and it's okay if we get emotional about it, Let's feel those feelings. Let people know when you need to talk about your loved one or not. Let others know if you prefer to cook the Thanksgiving meal or Christmas meal or to have others cook or eat out. No one's going to know unless you tell them. So it is about planning, about thinking about those traditions that are typical in your family and deciding if you want to do those. Be with a friend or friends who will let you grieve the way you wish and have your best interest at heart. A trusted friend who is there for you is priceless. As Doug Manning, a noted grief specialist says, a good friend is one who hangs around, hugs, and hushes. So you wanna find that friend or friends that you know are gonna be there and not necessarily give you advice. Maybe you just need to talk about your loved one Maybe you just need to hang around with someone. Maybe you need a hug. And maybe you just need someone there to hush so you can talk. Remember that the anticipation of the holiday is usually more stressful than the holiday itself. We give a lot of anticipation to the holiday season and how wonderful and bright it's going to be. It's important that we just realize that 
we got to take things day, one day at a time. Sometimes we have to take it one hour at a time. And if one hour at a time isn't working, then we got to do a minute at a time. Um, we want to endure bonds with our loved one. And a way that we can do that is giving ourselves a special kind of gift during the holidays. You might try to imagine something that your loved one would have given you or done for you if he or she were still here. And you can do that for yourself. Give a special gift in memory of your loved one. That could be an altar, uh, flowers at the altar for your church, a poinsettia for someone in a nursing home, a monetary donation to your loved one's favorite charity. Have a special gathering with family and friends during the fall holiday season. Share favorite memories of your loved one while looking through a photo album. Light a remembrance candle. The candle can you know, symbolize both the one that you've lost and the light for the path ahead for your future. Say a special prayer, a poem, and dedicate it to him or her. Bring them into it. Help them, bring them into the present. Help them not be forgotten. Talk about them. And then continuing your life story. Having a plan for the holidays and planning it with your family is important. We got to, knowing how your structure, how to structure your time tends to, tends to help you anticipate schedules rather than just letting things happen. Discussing everyone's needs and struggles with your family breaks the silence and everyone is relieved to know what to expect from one another. And I understand this can be hard in some families for sure, but you know, we want to give ourselves an opportunity to really just share how what we need during this holiday season. And it's okay to also say, I don't know what I need, but I know that this may not help me. This is giving me, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that. Give yourself permission to change family and holidays traditions for this year. Just because you change your tradition this year doesn't mean that you can't go back to it the next year. Um, have the kids decorate the Christmas tree or the home. Let someone else cook the holiday meal or have a potluck. Go elsewhere for the holidays. Get away. Have a holiday that brings comfort instead of joy. Um, volunteer your time or skills for a few hours. One really great way, and I think it's a part of self-care too, is to do things for others. Um, and, and doing something for others in that person's name, maybe um, helping in the community with a Thanksgiving or Christmas meal for the homeless, uh, making a care basket for the women's shelter, donating toys for Toys for Tots or some organization, that helps you connect to that spirit of the season. We may not feel a ton of joy throughout the season, but that will help us connect to the spirit of the season and bring us comfort. And be aware that your greatest happiness may come in doing something for someone else. It's often a turning point in your grief when you give of yourself. And you find that giving of yourself, doing something for others, feels good. It does bring you joy. And you may want to do that more and more. Um, in the packet, and I can get you this handout. I don't have it for the slideshow. Um, and I wish I would have brought the candles, but I wanted to share with you a way that you can bring your loved one into the holidays um, with a little ceremony that you can do. When my grandfather died the, the first year we had Thanksgiving without him, we did this, and it was very meaningful. We felt, pre we felt that he was present. We felt like we were honoring him. And so what you'll do is get four candles, and I'll read you the script. This is called Light the Path. As we light these four candles in honor of our loved ones, we light one for our grief, one for our courage, one for our memories, and one for our love. The first candle represents our grief, our broken hearts and shattered stories. The pain of our loss is intense. It reminds us of the depth of the love that we had for you that we have for you. The second candle represents our courage to confront our sorrow. 
to comfort each other and to change our lives. The third candle is lit in your memory. The times we laughed, the times we cried, the times that we were angry at each other, the silly things that you did, the caring and the joy that you gave us. And the fourth candle represents the light of love. We will always cherish the unique person that you were. A special place in our hearts will always be reserved for you. We love you. It's a beautiful way to bring them along as a part of the holiday season and to, to make them a part of, of our life, to make them a part of things, to, get to, to continue to have them a part of things. We may even want to set an extra, an extra place at the table for them and put a picture there if you'd like. These are just things, ideas that we have that, that you can utilize, but ultimately talking about it, you might develop even better ones. It may be that for Christmas Eve, you go to the um, cemetery and bring flowers or balloons or um, that person's favorite Christmas you know, ornament. There's different ways that we can come up with um, special ways to honor them. And that's what's important is that we honor them. I want to lastly share with you that um, through VTOS, we have national support groups that are available to anyone in the community. You don't have to have used um, VTOS hospice. Um, it's for anyone in the nation. Um, you can go to VTOS.com and register for these grief support groups. Some are online via Zoom and others are just phone in. You'll get a 1-800 number and dial a passcode and you'll be connected to these support groups. There's a facilitator like myself, a bereavement manager from somewhere in the country from VTOS that will be a facilitator and help guide you and whoever, what other you know, um, participants are on for the support groups. And that can be very useful. Support groups as we're dealing with grief, as we're grieving, can be very helpful. It gives us a place to talk to others who are also grieving and feeling many of the same things that we're feeling. We feel a common bond with them. We feel like, oh, I feel that way too. I felt that way. And this is how I helped myself. It's just a good place to understand, to, uh, to, to really connect with others. In addition, um, on December, Thursday, December 9th, and then Friday, December 10th, on December 9th, um, 6 o'clock Central Time, and December 10th, 1 o'clock Central Time, you can go to vitas.com as well and register for um, a virtual holiday event that we're having. It's a national holiday event. Um, it's called Cherishing the Memories. And it's where you can come and join others who are coping with the loss of a loved one during the holiday season. It's a Zoom event. VTOS will be hosting it, and um, there will be VTOS bereavement specialists like myself that will guide and support anyone who joins as we celebrate our loved ones. We're going to have um, music, poetry, the sharing of treasured memories, and a digital lighting, a candle lighting tribute. This is something that you as a family can gather and watch together. In the chat, you can identify your loved one's name, share a special memory of them. Do that as something, a way to remember them, right? It's all about bringing them with us and holding that space for them. So I thank you so much for joining. And I've provided several different um, resources that Erica has here at the library now about grief and loss, um, children and grief, um, teens and grief, a journal for teens, a booklet called um, When Death Has Passed, Living From Here. It's really wonderful to be able to read that and, and see that some of those feelings that you're having, those reactions that you're having to grief as abnormal as they feel are normal for grief. Thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm.